Again, welcome everyone to the First Baptist uh, Midweek Noon Wednesday Bible Study. Today we'll be looking at the Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 11 and going through to the end of the chapter. Uh, that is verse 31. And those 20 some odd verses tells us the parable of the lost son. It's interesting that we know that parable by a slightly different name, but the word that we include uh, as part of that description or title of this parable actually does not appear in the Bible, but it is an appropriate adjective or description of this son that, we're, that becomes a central part of the parable. We'll look at that as we go through the verses today. In one minute or about 20 seconds, we'll open with prayer, and then we will not skip Margaret Graham's uh, musical selection today at the start of our session. I'm not hurt, but faith of our fathers for Father's Day. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll be with you shortly, and we are eagerly anticipating. Okay. Are there any announcements that anybody would like to make? When is Ben Henderson's funeral? It's this Saturday. Family hour is at 12 and the service begins at 1. Thank you. Thank you. And I would presume amongst this uh, community of scholars, it goes without saying that this week at First Baptist Church, beginning at 5 p.m. and ending promptly at 8 p.m. is vacation Bible study. I encourage all who have not yet attended to please do so beginning tonight. Again, 5 p.m. is the dinner hour. Dinner is served until approximately 5.45 p.m., uh, which gives us time to adjourn from the fellowship hall up to the sanctuary where opening ceremonies take place each night. And at 6 p.m. promptly, classes begin for at least four different age groups. Uh, the adults are among them, and then we have at least three subcategories other than the adult class. Uh, we've completed two nights of study at this point, and tonight will be the third night. Each night has been enriching and rewarding and a rewarding study of the Word of God, and we fully anticipate that to continue for the next couple of nights. And we look forward to all of you to remain in attendance or begin attending. With that having been said, I'll now we'll now open with prayer. If anybody feels led, please feel free to lead us in prayer at this time. If not, let us go to God in prayer. Father God, it is yet another occasion that you have blessed us and enabled us to gather together to study your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your presence will be such that it will light on us and make our minds and our hearts fertile ground for the seed, which is your word. We pray further, God, that that word will take root in our lives and bring forth fruit in our daily interactions with our brothers and sisters, and even those who are seeking to establish a relationship with you. Father God, we pray that everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that every thought we might have today will be pleasing in thy sight and in thy presence. Father God, our prayer and desire is to be at last saved, that we might spend eternity where Jesus is. Lord God, we pray for First Baptist Church from the front door to the baptism. Father God, we pray your blessings upon that entity that it might be the church you've called it to be. 
Heavenly Father, you know our current situation. We pray, Lord, that you will continually have your hand upon us and guide us and lead us as we take this next step toward securing our next senior pastor. Father God, we pray these and all prayers in the matchless name of your son, our Christ, and we say amen. 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 Okay, today, um, um, Ms. Graham, please. You ready? I'm re we're ready. Okay. Today, we continue in Luke chapter 15. We start at verse 11, and we'll go through the end of the chapter, uh, which is verse 32. Today's lesson topic is the parable of the lost son. And, and how, do, how do we, how do we uh, name that parable? Usually we say the prodigal son. Okay, we say the prodigal son. P-R-O-D-I-G-A-L. Prodigal son. Again, that word prodigal does not appear in the Bible. And but we have we have taken that word to describe what does that what does the word prodigal mean? Does anybody know? Feel free to Google it <laughs> or pull out a dictionary. But what does prodigal mean? Somebody, anybody? Prodigal. Rocket, go ahead and ask Alexa. I don't have my phone down here with me. Okay. Uh, Alexa just gave an elaborate definition, but uh, the bottom line is it, it's a negative term. It's, it's not meant to be positive. And what it describes is someone who spends money extravagantly, wastefully, and foolishly. So while the word prodigal is not in the Bible, does this <laughs> describe the son that we're gonna we're gonna read about here? Yes. Okay. Is spending money extravagantly is that by itself um negative? Only when you don't have it to spend. Okay. <laughs> Veronica said, when you don't help others. Okay. Do Does anybody we know or anything that we're aware of um, spend extravagantly on us or on others? Say it again louder. Veronica said, God. 
Is God extravagant in what he does for us? Yes. I'll try that again. Is God extravagant in what he does for us? Yes. 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 Come on, everybody. Yes. yes. How, how do we how do we how do we know that? What does God give us? The E word. Everything. Eternal life. Okay. Eternal life for sure. He gives us the opportunity, but he he gives us everything. 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 Everything, we everything. Need. everything we need. He yes. gives it to us. Mm -hmm. He gives us everything we need. Mm -hmm. yes. Certainly, certainly everything we need to achieve eternal life. And, and what was his most extravagant gift to us? His son. His son. His death on the cross. Jesus Christ. His death on John 3.16. He so loved the world. And this is one time we should willingly, openly, and repeatedly acknowledge that we are the world. He so loved us. He so loved you. He so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's extravagant. Mm -hmm. It's not foolish. It's not wasteful. Which certainly separates him a great distance from the son we're going to read about today. But we do, so the point is that spending or, or being extravagant isn't always a negative characteristic. Again, the woman who she spent extravagantly when she gave her her last might or her last money to to the prophet or the person the woman who used the last of her meal to make a cake for the prophet that was extravagant because it was pretty much all she had but it was for the right reason and as a result she was blessed and that that jar never was empty it always was enough there for her and her son so again, and to prodigal as we use it and and titling this parable is a negative term because this speaks to not only ex being extravagant but being so with a wasteful intent or outcome. Okay, so we'll get into it and we'll take we'll take it maybe two verses at a time because we want to really look at what this parable because gen generically we all know what this story is. But we need to take a closer look at it because in each of the characters, we ought to look for, for ourselves in each of the players in this story. So as we begin, keep that in mind. If somebody would, please take verses 11 and 12. And then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. That's the New King James Version. Okay, thank you. So what's happening in those first two verses? He has a son that wants his, his share of whatever the father is going to leave the, both of his sons. Okay, so a certain man, what, what did this man have? Among two other things, what did he have? Two sons. Yeah, two sons. Two sons. We don't know if he had daughters, but we know he had two sons. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, one, they weren't twins, so one was older and one was younger. And and what what happens in 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 verse twelve? One of the sons makes a request. Which son? And what is the request? It's the younger son, and he says, "Give me the goods 
that that would fall on me or that I guess I would inherit. Okay. So here's the, the younger of this of the two sons. And what what is the, what what do we attribute to, to younger children in a family, generally speaking? What are some of the patients? What I'm sorry, what was that, Margaret? Impatience. Impatience, okay. So the younger, the younger they children say are, we're spoiled. Okay, they they may be spoiled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anybody experience this in their own families or with their own children? Sometimes. Well, I don't like. I, I I don't care for the word spoiled because I'm an only child and I had to live with that all my life. <laughs> well sometimes but, the truth sometimes the truth is the truth but in my case it was not the truth but at any rate I was well taken care of Okay, but I wasn't spoiled I was well taken care of but All right. uh, but um, uh, youth has a tendency to not want to wait we can see that as i drive up and down the road how the young people be scooting behind me and carrying on mm -hmm. with youth they just got to get there right now they want it right now and give it to me right now <laughs> okay and that that certainly that that certainly was evident in in my family um <laughs> what do you think that is what is it about being the younger in a group that perhaps contributes to that I think sometimes it's that everybody older kind of dotes on the youngest of the of the family. They they pour more attention and time or resources into them than they because they have they have it. When as the older ones may they may not have had the the time or resources to put that much energy into the older ones. So when the younger ones come. The older children have gotten older and they, they share what they have and the parents and uncles and aunts and everybody kind of rally around and just dote on that younger child. Okay. Yeah. I've also had my friends who are, who are older and had younger siblings uh, say that. And the parent parenting is a very difficult job and the parents have just gotten tired. <laughs> <laughs> and so they that the younger children get away with things the older children didn't get away with because they just parents just don't have the energy. To, okay. Uh, so I, like I saw something. I saw something different with my girls. Is my youngest one wanted what she saw the older one getting, but at a much younger age. Okay. And and that speaks. I'm 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 certainly not clinically trained. But something about being siblings makes you feel like no matter where you fall in the pecking order, somehow you're on the same level as everybody else, hmm. regardless to the fact that they may have lived five, six, seven, eight, nine years longer than you have. And they have kind of, in air quotes, earned some of the things that they are that they possess versus you who are new on the scene and you have not yet earned what they have accumulated. And so you, you start looking at, well, the, we're all siblings. I should have what they have. It doesn't matter that I'm, I came along last. I'm impatient. I see my brother has it. My sisters have it. I should have it too. And so that could be part of, what was going on with this younger brother? Maybe he said, "You know what? I'm. I'm. In, in fact, he says, give me mine now. I don't know how much longer, Dad, you're going to be around here, hmm. but I can. I can. I. I can see myself doing some things if I had mine now. Okay." So at any rate, we got some, some family dynamics working themselves out in the first two verses of this parable. 
Okay, so the younger son, the one that perhaps was a little impatient, the one that perhaps perhaps felt unjustifiably entitled to to what he saw or what he imagined was his already. And so in verse 12, sure enough, the younger of, of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And what did, what did the father do? He gave it to him. And in this parable, in these verses, without a word, Without a discussion, without any a cautionary tale, he didn't even share a cautionary tale with the younger son. He just, when the son made the request, the father, like, just like an order taker, went about fulfilling that younger son's request. But what did it also require? You mean on the part of the son after the dad on, gave him his his um on, on the on the father? What did the father do? Hmm? What did it cost the father? Did it well, cost him what his he son? owned? It cost him his cost son him a, a third of his livelihood. Oh, okay. Dad wasn't gone yet. <laughs> and this son is, is before time is, is making a request on his dad and so his dad says okay I have I'll take a third because the oldest son was entitled to a double portion so whatever he was he was taking a third of his livelihood and handing it over to the younger son mm hmm and that was whatever he, it says he, he took a, he divided his, yeah, the father gave him the portion of his good that falls to him and divided unto him his living. The father's living, not the, the younger son hadn't, hadn't earned anything perhaps yet. So the father divided what he had spent a lifetime accumulating, took a third of it and handed it over to the younger son. And again, without any discussion, without any quarreling, without any, without any negotiating, without signing a, an agreement or anything else, the son made the request and he gave it to him. Do we go to God like that? Let's be honest. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes we do. Yes. Yes, we do. Did this younger son, as far as we know, as far as the scripture is telling us, and we all know the story, so we know how this thing works out. Did this younger son have a plan? No. 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 So he had big, do you think, big, do you big, think big the ideas? I huh? say again. He had big ideas, but he, didn't he have really a plan. did. <laughs> but is an I is an idea a plan? Uh, well, no. no, not really, huh? -uh. Not a really. Plan is how you no. A plan is how you're going to do something. An idea is I want to do this, but a plan is how you're going to get to the result that you want. An idea is just an idea. Exactly. We we looked at a a parable not too long ago. I believe we did it. It said count the cost, didn't it? Mm hmm. Yes. Before you get out there trying to build a house and you get you lay the foundation and find out you don't have the money to build the first, second, or third floor to this house. All you got is you laid a beautiful foundation, but now the work has stopped because you spent all the money on the foundation. So having an having an idea is not the same thing as having a plan. Mm -hmm. Do you think the father knew he didn't have a plan? Yes. Yes, he he certainly did. <laughs> okay. Do you think God knows if we have a plan or not? <laughs> yes. But does he give us oftentimes exactly what we pray for? No. He allows Sometimes us free he does. Will. 
Sometimes yeah, he gets, sometimes, sometimes he, he gets it to you. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, he allows us free will. And and what about last night when you went to sleep, or when I went to sleep? Did I pray for everything I would need this day? I don't know. Something we don't. I don't know. Did I did I pray, <laughs> Lord? Please let the air God still be. Please let the air still be breathable. Please let the water still be drinkable. Please let the sun shine tomorrow. Please let the weather not be so hot that it cooks us. No, no, you didn't pray all that. But God, Father, thank to, God for what you had yesterday and and pray and, that he watch over you while you sleep. And mm-hmm. thank him in advance for what he's going to do, but you don't ask all individually, specifically what you're saying. And that's why the prayer he taught us was so perfect that Jesus taught us, give us, Lord, our daily bread. Right. Whatever I need to survive the next day, mm-hmm. I'm praying that you do that. That way you don't have to pray for the million and one mm-hmm. things you might need specifically. Give me daily bread. Sustain me for one more day. And so when we pray like that, we don't necessarily have to have that detailed plan down to the minute of minute details of what it takes to live each day. But this son, on an impulse, just out of the blue, we don't know the background story. We don't know if he had had a rough night, a rough week, had had a fight with the brother, or the brother threatened that when I when dad is gone, I'm gonna rule over you with an iron hand. I'm gonna make But out of nowhere, this son says, Dad, give me the portion of goods that I'm entitled to just being your son. And the father turns and gives him the money. If somebody would, please take verses 13 and 14, and let's see how this story begins to unfold. Okay, this is the easy version. After a few days, the younger son sold what his father had given to him. Then he took all the money and left home. He went on a long journey to a country far away. There he did whatever he wanted to do and wasted all his money. After he had spent everything, there was no rain, there was no rain in that country. There was almost no food anywhere so the young man had nothing to eat wow okay and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey so the son the the dad didn't write him a check he gave him a third of his livelihood That means if dad had animals, he got a third of the animals. If he had crops, he got a third of that. If he had property, he got a third of the property. So the dad divided everything he had accumulated in his lifetime that he was going to pass on to his sons. And he gave the younger son a third of it. Again, this included everything, property, livestock, Jewel, whatever he had. And what did the youngest son do with it? Did he did he load up wagons and barrels and camels and take all these goods on the road with him? No. No. He, he sold it. He sold, he sold it. it. Yep. And how quickly did he do this? Not soon. Soon after his daddy gave him the the his good, his portion. He um he quickly sold everything, got the money, hit the road. <laughs> and, and, and what what kind of decisions when you make do you make when you make them in a hurry? If you wanted to convert goods or stuff into cash real fast, where would you go? Let's not pretend we don't know. Some people go to the pawn shop. Pawn shop That's where you go. Maker. You go to the pawn shop, right. and when you get to the pawn shop. They are not your friend. No. 
You might have this ring that was passed down through 10, 11, 12, 13 generations. But you go to that pawn shop broker, he don't care about how long or what it means to your family. I'll give you $30 for that ring. What? This yeah. ring is worth at least $300. I'll give you $30 for that ring. The point is, this younger son took what his dad had accumulated, took a third of what his, his father had accumulated over a lifetime and quickly converted it to cash, would probably, which probably means he didn't get the value of what his dad gave him when he converted it to cash. So right off the bat, he lost a, a, a significant part of what his dad had given him. And that's before he left home, which is why that tag prodigal gets attached to this son, because he was foolish in his extravagant and in his haste. So he quickly converts all of his, a third of his father's goods into cash, something he could stuff in his pockets or into a satchel and take with him on the road. And does he move just on the other side of the county? No. What does it say he did? He went where? He goes to a foreign country. A country, yeah. Yeah, a far oh, off. So man. he goes, he leaves. So wherever he's going, he's not going to have a whole lot of people there that he's familiar with. So mm -hmm. more than likely nobody there is going to be looking out for him. They'll be looking for him, but they won't be looking it, out for him. Right. I've got an interesting um Ver my verse is, after you explain the definition of prodigal in verse 13 of my Bible, mm -hmm. it reads, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. I thought that was pretty interesting. It's like, you don't, I didn't see that word until... They talk about the way he lived. And after you gave us the definition, it's like, oh, okay, that explains a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that, again, that term was negative. It's that he was, a, he, this son was extravagant. So he was just spending, go something, get, get a little, you want a snack? No, I don't, I'm going to go pay for the most expensive meal on the menu and just eat a portion of it. Well, I'm going to take five people with me and we're going to buy up the most expensive items in whatever the store might be selling. So he was very wasteful, extravagant and wasteful. And the commentary in my Bible says the younger son wasted no time in wasting all his father had given. Mm. So he, he was, was living large. That's and one of the words we talked about. Somebody gave us that word about the younger child being impatient. Mm -hmm. And this son is certainly, this younger son is certainly exhibiting impatience. He's in a hurry. And what happens soon after, in, in verse 13, I, I guess it says, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. If somebody would, please take verses 15 and 16. He went to a man who lived in that country. He asked to work for him. So the man sent him into his fields to give food to his pigs. Mm. No, nobody gave him anything to eat. He even he even wanted to eat the food that the pigs were eating, but he had nothing. Wow. So here it is in a very short time period. He goes from living in a household where all he had to do, and, and we don't know what his tasks were at home, but all he had to do was continue to be obedient to his father, 
Mm-hmm. Stay at home with food that didn't appear to be a, a, a shortage of anything at his home. But he took all his, what was what he was entitled to. And soon he finds himself in a position where not only is all of what he what his father gave him gone, but now he has to work to eat. And where he, the, this foreign country he's gone to is so bad that there's, there's hardly any food to be eaten. And so he, he joins with somebody to, to, to get a job. And, this, and what is his job? Or at least part of his job is to do what? Feed the pig. And what was this man's heritage? What, 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 who was he? Jewish, was Jewish. He? He was Jewish. And how did Jews feel about pigs? They did not eat them. They were unclean and they were an unclean animal to eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jews, they didn't want to be anywhere near. They they viewed them as being dirty, unclean, like you just said, unclean animals. They didn't want to be around them much less eat them. Deacon Davis. Yes. If if you've ever seen slop, the stuff they feed pigs, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, when the scripture says he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating, that I was like, ooh. (laughs) And and what but what what makes that even worse? And and granted, I mean my my mom prepares them, and I have two sisters that love them, and I'm talking about chitlins now. Hello. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. And a couple of other folks in the family dabble with them. No. But even that somehow is different than eating what the pigs eat. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, him being a Jew, it's like you can't get any, you almost can't get any lower than that. But here he is going from a, ha- a home where his father had sufficient riches to take a third of what he owned and give it to this younger son without as much as saying, Be careful how you spend this money because this is a lot of money that I'm giving you. And this guy goes off, and before you know it, to turn a phrase, he finds himself at the lowest possible point a Jew possibly could be. So now we see where that title, Prodigal, perfectly fits this guy. And Deacon, are any of us in the, have any of us been? Are we currently, or are we on our way to being in the situation that this prodigal son was in, or this this lost son was in? With Deacon Tom Davis, what I um struck, what struck me about this before he even got to the um pig pen to have to feed them is that he had no thought of the future. He was living in the present. So on top of being impatient, he just spent up all his money as fast as he could. He wasn't even thinking about what may or may not happen down the road. I should save a couple of pennies just in case something goes wrong. And that goes back to him. He didn't have a plan. Right. He just went and whatever he thought to do, he was like a little kid in a candy store. Every piece of candy looked, I got to have it. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. And before you get in the candy store good enough, you've got a stomach ache and maybe (laughs) your teeth starting to hurt. (laughs) And you just got in the candy store because you're trying to eat every piece of candy you see. (laughs) <laughs> you don't have a plan. You're being reckless. 
Well, maybe he did have a plan, but his plan led to the road of destruction because mm -hmm. he didn't figure it out. He couldn't see further down the road because he had been living a good life and his father had been providing for him. So his plan was to party hardy, but uh, he didn't realize at the end of that road, uh, he would not be taken care of. And now he's he's not in the he's not in the back seat anymore, because he his position at home was, I'm the youngest, I've got parents, I've got an older brother, perhaps older sisters, and I'm everybody everybody is in the position to take help take care of me, and from my perspective, I think I could do things better, but you have no experience, you have no idea what it takes. And so you get out there and you go for all the flashy things, all the shining lights, all the sparkling objects. And before you know it, you have gone through all of your resources and it's dinner time and you didn't, buy, you didn't go shopping. You just went to a restaurant and ate the most extravagant meal yesterday. And then today you're broke and hungry, but you don't have anything you don't have cabinets. You don't have you don't have food to put in the cabinet. You don't have cabinets that you could have put food in. And now you are out here feeding hogs and desiring. You're so hungry. You're desiring to eat what you've been charged to feed to the pig to the swine. And you're a Jew. And your father is sitting at home still with two thirds of his wealth, and your older brother is. is going about his mundane daily chores and not thinking about any of the things you're now up to your eyeballs in. Okay. If somebody would, please take verses 17 and 18. This is from the good news. Mm -hmm. At last he came to his senses and said, all my father's hard workers have more than, than they can eat. And here I am about to starve. I will get up, go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. Okay. So so what is what is he practicing right there? What is he what is he in the process of doing? That R word. Repenting. Re repenting. So it says he, he, he came to himself, which means he saw how much he had messed up. It's interesting how far some people have to fall before they come to themselves. Amen. Is that a reality? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. And what what helped him, what illustration did he use here to show what position he was now in compared to how things were back at his father's place? What did he say? He, who did he say had more than what he had? His father's servant. His father's servant. He said, how many of my father's servants have more than enough food to eat? And here I am, so hungry, I, a Jew, of some standing, want to eat what the swine are eating. He's gone past turning his nose up that swine are a dirty and unworthy animal. No, you you so far past that that didn't stop because you were caring for the swine. Now you're so far down, you want to eat. You're so hungry, you want to eat what the swine are eating. Nineteen and twenty. This guy, he had a hard head. Yeah. But what do they say? A hard head makes what? Soft behind. A soft, a soft behind. <laughs> so it took a lot of, his head was really hard because this is quite a whipping he had to endure before he finally came to himself. He was right on the verge of eating pig slop before he snapped out of it and said, wait a minute. My father has servants who are doing better than them. 
And so what did he decide he needed to do? I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Yes, you. Okay. And this is the, well, the first time he's acknowledging that anything was more than, it was more than about just him. He is now acknowledging, you know what? Heaven, God has instructed us that we ought not be dealing with swine, that as Jews, we need to live a certain way. And then my father, I, I took his a third of his possessions and have completely wasted it. So he's acknowledging, I sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you, dad. So he's practicing what he's going to tell his dad. Okay? Uh -uh. What does that say about him? At long last, what does that say about him? Somewhere in him, he did have some integrity. He did have some streak of, of self-pride or had learned something from somebody along the way. But look what it took for him to finally tap into it. Hmm. Now, whose fault was it? He Was, was it his... His father's fault for giving him the money without giving him proper counsel? Was it his brother's fault for saying, you know what, little brother, things are tough around here for you. Don't leave home. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do your work for you for the, until you figure things out. Whose fault was it that he wound up where he was? He is. He is his own fault. We can't say that was poor parenting, that his dad, his dad knew he couldn't handle that. Wasn't that irresponsible to dad to give him that money? No, his dad no. to let him learn a lesson. Sometimes That's you right. can't tell people. You have to it let them do tough it love. for themselves. Some tough, okay, okay. So does God give us some tough love? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. If, if you're going through something, is that... Is that sometimes God's tough love? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is, is it love or is it punishment? No. It's a learning experience for you. Yeah. A teaching okay. he gives us free will. For you. He gives <laughs> us free will to make our own decisions. He hopes that we would do the right thing, but he allows us to choose. It is pun if that being the case. Is punishment part of love? Yes. Yes. How do we know that? But this more punishment comes from consequences. Yes, but how do we know punishment is part of love? There's a verse somewhere in there that says that. God, say that verse. God chastens those he loves. Chases, mm -hmm. those he loves. That's right. Plus, Chasing we've seen it in history. We've seen Chasing it is, a, is a fixed up word yeah. that means punished. Chasing means and you're correcting somebody. And probably about that the correction lot. comes by punishment. You gotta cut uh you gotta discipline your children. Yeah. Did God love the, the, the Israelites? Yes. Yes. Did he chasten them? Yes. Lord, yes. <laughs> he told them ahead of time they didn't listen. He gave them se several chances and then he chose to let them know he meant what he said. That you, I, I told you up front. Right. And we we saw that when Jesus uh, had the one or maybe two parables ago where he had amassed a, a huge multitude that was following him. And before they went too much further, he said, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. There's a cost to following me. Don't think this is going to be one big fish fry every day. We're going to be sitting down taking two loaves and three fishes and collecting 12 baskets of extras at the end. No, that won't be the case all the time. There's a cost to following me. You need to take up your cross and bear it, every one of you. And part of that cross is the chastening that comes to those whom God loves. Okay, so this Younger son, boy, he's being chastened or punished or whipped or whooped.
but he has it has it's paying off because he came to himself and realized that not only had he sinned against heaven, he had sinned against his father, his earthly father, that I wasted the resources you gave me. And so I owe God an apology for, for not following his instructions. And then I wasted what you gave me, my earthly father. So if somebody would take the next two verses. You can read. I read it. I am no longer worthy to okay. be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now, we the last couple of weeks, we looked at some other parables, and the same thing is playing itself out here. Mm -hmm. Now, how did the father act when he saw this son? Did he wait for the son to show up at the door and ring the bell and say, Dad, I'm home? No. What did the father yeah. do? He, he ran and man, he ran to him. Yeah, he saw him coming. And he, you had to know that Dad... Uh, or you can imagine that the time period that that son had been gone, dad was was praying and worried about that son because he knew his son. Where is this boy? What is he out there doing? I hope he's safe. I hope God is protecting him. I hope he realizes that he had it made right here. And then lo and behold, in the distance, he see the son come and he's excited. And he can't wait for that son to take however many more steps or cover whatever distance remains. He ran out and met the son. And what was what actions did he take when he when he came face to face or came in contact with the son? He hugged and kissed. Had compassion on him. Yes, he walked him home like a hero. Do you think the dad knew? What the situation, what the story was going to be when he saw his son coming back? Yes. I think he knew it in the beginning. <laughs> there you go. He probably knew up front. How long will, will it be before he comes dragging his sorry butt? Mm -hmm. back here? That's has, right. He That's has right. no idea what's out there waiting for him. He thinks he it's may easy. He have hoped for the best, but he, 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 was, he wasn't sure. And so that's why he was watching because he thought he would come to his senses and come home. Uh huh. And I'm sure he had been praying, Lord, right. return him back to me, uh -huh. bring him back home. Send, give me, yes. let him come to himself before it's too late that we can try this again. Okay, so he goes out and meets the son. Somebody please take the next two verses. Twenty-one. Yes, and twenty-two. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Okay. So the father just go get, just go get some rags and wrap him up. What did the father request that be brought for his son? The best of everything. The, the best. Go get that robe that I had in there that I was saving for a special occasion. Go and get it. <laughs> go and get it because this is this is that occasion. Okay. If somebody would, take the next two verses. Mm. 23, 24. Bring the fattest calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For he, this, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, is found. So they began to celebrate. 
Okay. So not only did the dad personally greet him with a hug and a kiss and bring a robe and put a robe on his back and put sandals on his, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, but go kill the, the, the fattest calf or the fat and, and, and prepare it. We're going to have a, we're going to have a celebration. Okay. Now who's being extravagant? The father. The dad. But is he being, but is he, is he a prodigal in this regard? No. 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 Why is he not wasting it? Here's a guy that just blew a third of what, of your lively, of your wealth, dad. And he comes home and you, you're giving him, you're killing the fattest calf. You're putting the best robe on him. You're putting the ring on. Hasn't he shown you he's not worthy? He even confessed with his own mouth. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. And you're treating him like not only a son, but the son. Is that not being wasteful? No, the father's so thankful to see his son and so happy to have him back safe and sound. He's willing to show how much he loves him. And, I and think the son the showed thing. remorse. The son showed remorse. He didn't, I mean, he 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 apologized to his father. Right. Told his father how sorry he was. And the father was probably saying to himself, I'm sorry you went through this, but thank God you learned a lesson. Yeah, and look, look how the father described. He said this son was what? He was dead. He dead. Was dead. Yeah. And now he's alive. And just in the, the parable before this one, I think it we read where it says in the angels in heaven rejoice more when someone is saved than they do for all the folks who are already saved. Mm -hmm. When the lost comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when the lost comes back. We've read about that in the last two or three parables. Mm -hmm. Okay? If somebody would, please pick up at 26 and 27. I'm sorry, 25 and 26. Here, come, here comes the, another character from the story. He's been <laughs> asking for quite a while, but here he comes. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brothers come, and thy father have killed the fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Keep, and keep he doing. was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make me of my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Okay. Now, the older brother... We're gonna we're gonna pile on this guy. We're gonna we're gonna lay him out right now. <laughs> how, did, how did he describe his young? Did he call him his brother? How did he describe the young to to the father? Let's go back up to verse twenty seven, and he said. Is that it? Um, yeah. Oh, no, it, it wasn't 27. It's, it's 29, I think. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress thy at any of thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as, it's verse 30, but as soon as this, Thy son. He didn't say as soon as my brother. He said this, thy son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he didn't want to take any, he didn't want to acknowledge any relationship to his younger brother. 
He said, as soon as this, thy son comes back, you, you're doing all this. So he's not acknowledging his relationship to his younger brother. He's putting it on his father. This is thy son. This ain't my brother. This is your son. He ain't my brother. He's separating himself from his brother or trying to do so in front of his father because he feels he's so much better than this younger brother that we, we can't be brothers. Well, I he's think he was also son. hurt. He I, I, I is. He, but, but, he's hurt, and and he can't see beyond being hurt. That he his feelings is I've been here all the time, and we never you never did all this for me. Not realizing that the dad had been doing things for him all along, but to him it seems like he's done something extra special for the brother who went off and wasted, and then he's yeah, back. And that hurt. And and, and this, this case, we gotta we gotta peel that hurt onion because yeah, that's the nice thing. That would be his story. I'm hurt. Right. But what do you have to be hurt about? Well, also the thing that jumps out to me is when he came back, the father didn't he sent him to get clothes and stuff, but he didn't sense like somebody go out in the field and get the brother so he can come and help celebrate. What does he left him out there? And when the little when he came back, I mean this party was going on and he didn't even know what was going on. That was kind of a, a resentment too. What is going mm -hmm. on? They having a party mm -hmm. and they didn't even he, you know, and he's not even included. But what is all that speak? What does all that say about the older brother? We gotta we gotta be rough with this guy because because we well, sounds like jealousy. Yeah, you know, I see jealous. a lot of sibling rivalry. But the bottom line, what was going on here is he was being absolutely no better. And at this point, he's behaving worse than the younger brother. Because the older brother at this point. He's being totally selfish. He's making it all about him. It, this I think that's human nature. I it, think it, that's, and, that is again, human nature. Human nature will land you so deep in hell. Right. You will hate that you ever knew what human was. I know, but you know, you see it in families. You know, the one who stays there and takes care of Elle and mom or dad, and then the other right. ones are out living life and doing whatever. Then when mom and dad pass, here come the other ones, you yeah. know, and, and want to take over and all of that, you know, and, <laughs> and the one who's left feels some kind of way. It, it, that's true. But he, he, here's the challenge. Here's the cross. Yeah, help me, help me. Here's the cross that Jesus was talking about when he said, you have to bear your cross. You have to, as Paul said, we have to renew our minds. And as a, as a, as a disciple, as a follower, as a Christian, you will, you will understand the words, but you're going to have to work with this. And that's what being a Christian is working with what I'm about to say. Everything and just that, everything we do, say, or think ought to be to glorify God. That's no small statement, but it's true. And so when you say, I'm hurt by what somebody else is doing for somebody. How are you hurt if everything you do? Well, I took care of mom. Who were you taking care of mom for? So you could be more vaunted or more lauded than your brothers and sisters who weren't taking care of mom? Or were you doing it to glorify God, mm -hmm. to honor what God told us we ought to do, honor your mother and father? Mm -hmm. If you well, were doing it for anything, but if but, if the one if you're doing it for God, then you I don't nobody can make me feel any kind of way about. It. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because I'm not doing it for rewards that other people might do it for. I'm doing this because I love God so much. That's my motivation for doing it. And the joy I get from doing it, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Right. So whether I get paid or not, I'm not doing it for the pay. I'm doing it because in my mind and in my heart, this is what God wants me to do. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. If you're doing it for what God wants you, you know that's the thing to do. I mean, you know that's the thing to do, and you uh -huh. do it. You know? Right, and it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what come what comes as a result. If you get if other people around you are being that's part, it, you feel some kind of way. Well, that's the cross that I, Jesus told me I would have to bear. But what I'm doing, I'm doing it for you, Lord. And if people are going to think I'm a sucker, you stayed home and took care of your mother all this time, and and. June Bug came back and he, they gave him the car. That wasn't right. Well, I wasn't doing it for the car. I was doing it because I loved the Lord. The Lord told me to honor my mother and father. And I think taking care of my mother is honoring her. I wasn't doing this because I was hoping to get the car when she closed her eyes or get the house when it was time to read the will. I wasn't doing it for those things. It, it would have been nice had I got the car or the house or the property. But that's not what I was doing it for. So if I don't get those things, it's not going to make me say, wow, I wish I had stopped 10 years ago. But we say that's human nature. Yeah, it is. But human nature won't get you into heaven. It's, it's, and that's why people say it's hard to, yeah, it's, it's hard to deny yourself. But that's what it takes. That's the cross Jesus was talking about bearing. He wasn't talking about you were physically going to carry a cross up a hill and be crucified on it. But no, to follow him, you're going to have to forego a whole lot of the stuff that appeals to this, this natural body. And that everybody else is doing that, but you have been called to a higher purpose. Bear that cross. Don't go to this party. Come to vacation Bible school. <laughs> bear that cross don't go to jazz in the park go to church bear that cross remember what you're doing it for you're not doing it for the rewards of the world or for a personal acknowledgement or, or self gain you're doing it for the Lord and if that's not your motivation everything else is going to fail it's going to leave you disappointed. It's going to leave you hungry, desiring to eat what the swine are eating. And too many of us has got, have gotten comfortable eating what the swine eat. And we don't come to ourselves. We keep hiding behind, oh, that, that, they hurt my feelings because they didn't acknowledge all that work I did, and then they're giving out certificates at, at Friday at Vacation Bible, and I didn't even get a certificate. And I'm the one that cleaned up the kitchen after they all ate and upstairs in arts and crafts. I'm down there in the kitchen cleaning up, and they ain't and said my name. Ain't none of my pictures on the posters that's around here. That ain't right. Well, what were you doing it for? Dick and Davis. It reminds yeah. me of Mary and Martha. Remember how Martha, Mary was, Martha was upset because Mary wasn't helping her prepare for Jesus. And he reminded her that Mary chose the right thing. Uh -huh. um, but that's part of, that's what I meant about human nature. Martha was doing what she felt would be good. For, she was preparing the meal and clean up the house and get things ready. While Mary was sitting there listening to Jesus. But Martha thought she was doing what was good because she was making preparation and doing for him. But Jesus reminded her, like what you're saying, the, the better thing is to do what's pleasing to God. Right. And it's sometimes hard to decide when you think your purpose is one thing and somebody else's is something else. And then it turns out that what you're doing is not as important.
way as what the other person did. And you have to be reminded. So that's what I meant. Absolutely. You're, you're exactly right. And what we have to do in, in cases like that, because both of them served, both Mary and Martha served a, served a, a good purpose in that regard. Jesus did point out what was more meaningful at that on that occasion. But again, as, as um, Reverend Campbell is covering in Corinthians, he's talking about now how every member of the body has a different function, but you all work right. together right. to make the body what it's supposed to be or all that mm -hmm. it could be. Mm -hmm. So as long as what you're doing is for God and long as what everybody else is doing is for God, mm -hmm. we shouldn't have rivalries against each other. Everybody can't be the eye. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to be the ear. Somebody's got to be the foot. Somebody's got to be the toenail. Mm -hmm. But you're all part of the body and you can't be at war against each other because then the body's not going to work properly. And so, yeah, it is absolutely a true statement that all of this comes from us being human, but nobody knows better that we are human than God. But being human is not an excuse to be wrong. It can be the reason you're wrong, but it's not an excuse to be wrong because God has given us what we need to overcome human nature and take on the nature of Christ. It ain't a piece of cake. It's a moment by moment, second by second choice that we have to continuously make. I'm doing this for God. I'm not doing it for the rewards that might come from man or from whatever, or position or self-gratification. I'm doing this for God. And the way I am able to continuously do this, I stay on my knees and I stay in the word. And that's what keeps me encouraged and keeps me moving forward. Yeah, there's a whole lot of things I could be doing. There's a whole lot of ice cream socials I've missed but I'm serving for a higher purpose. And that's what we have to commit ourselves to and celebrate and worship God for. We are like 10 minutes past time and that brown man don't show no sign of slowing down, but I'm going to stop right now. Anybody have any thoughts on this, this lesson of the lost son? It is the, it, at, at the end of this parable, is the younger son better off than he was at the beginning or worse off? And let's take the same question for the older son. Real quick, is the younger son better off? I say he, yes. Yes. He and and why is he better off? He learned a lesson for himself. He learned. He, he, he was received back. back into his family. That's right. And, he, and his dad was there waiting to receive him back. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about the, the older son? No, I'm not sure. That one, he, he's going to have. don't know, gonna... but just, just like I was saying about Martha and Mary, Jesus had to share with them that Mary was doing the better thing. And so mm -hmm. that sort of what's left here, uh, the father's reminding him, we thought you, your brother was dead and we we're, were glad to see him back. And all you had all these things all together. So we don't know if he repented because it doesn't tell us or he learned his lesson for what had happened. That, yeah, I've been here all the time. I could have done all this. My brother was lost and now he's back. And so the father sort of saying like Jesus, I think, shared with Mary and Martha that even though what you did, Martha, was pleasing and Mary did what was pleasing, but of the two, Mary did the most, the better thing. Right. And as far as we know, because it never described what, what the workload was for, for these two sons. Right. As far as we know, all they had to do is wake up every day and keep breathing, and that's all they had to do. 
But the the older son was out in the field, so he must That's have had right. something to do out there. Okay. He was out there. But... I mean, he, he may have, you know, had a responsibility for him to be out in the field. And he was uh -huh. still out in the field, yeah. And being the older son, he might have had a more responsible role to play than the youngest did in the first place, from what we gather. We don't know. Right. But e even with that being the case, and I, I believe me, I hear you, but still, yeah, you were out in the field, but whose field were you in? Did you own those fields? Oh, these are your father's fields. So everything you have is still not yours. It's, it's your father's. So all you, all you have to do is just be a decent son. You don't have to be the ideal son. Just be my son. Because I got you covered. You're never going to be hungry. Because I got servants that are eating every day. And you really could go off and do nothing. You could be like Hophni and Phineas. And anybody that was in vacation Bible school knows who they are. They're they, not. not that they were horrible sons, but they were still sons. And all they had to do was be the sons, and they had pretty much whatever they wanted. They went overboard, and they would wound up being horrible people and wound up dying because of their lifestyles. But all they had to do would be sons. And so don't be mad because your, your father provides for you, and somehow you think you did this. Even though you were a good son, Everything you had was because your father gave it to you. You weren't that incredibly good. You were just appreciative a little bit more than I was. But don't trip. Don't think you did all this. This is still daddy's feels, and he can do with them whatever he chooses. But sometimes we start thinking because I've, I've because I've, went to church more often than that person, I'm better, or I deserve more. No. Everything you have is a gift from your father. No matter how you feel, you stack up against your brother or sister. Anyway, we're way over. But, but it's, a, it's a tough reality. And yeah, we are going to feel some kind of way, but we got to remember, just like God is working on us, so is Satan. And he's going to cause you to see differences and how somehow you're not getting all what you deserve. But again, everything we have is a gift from God. We deserve nothing but death and eternal punishment. But God is merciful. And he loves us. And he treats us all like that younger son. He gives us what we ask for and then see what we do with. Do you really appreciate it? Or are you busy comparing you feel in some kind of way because you don't feel like you got as much as somebody else. And Forgetting Deacon, that all of it came from me. Okay. Deacon Tommy. We're way overboard. Okay, I just got this one last thing. I was thinking this, the younger son asked for what he wanted. The older son didn't ask, but maybe he just got a little jealous because I should have asked for my portion too. And who knows if maybe if Luke had him <laughs> one, maybe we see the older son asking for his and see what he does with it. <laughs> that would be a good story. And maybe we'll find a parable that kind of speaks to that side of the story. But yeah, you think you are such a great son. Let's see what you would do if you had, if you were put in a position at your younger brother, would you ever have come to yourself or would you have gone further? You have gotten used to eating the pig slop. Okay. <laughs> and, and right quick, what this teaches us. This teaches us how Jesus God cares to keep all those whom he died to save. He will see that not one will be lost when one go astray and, and returns to God. There is cause to rejoice. Every one of us is precious to him. That's exactly right. 
Thank you all. I apologize for going so far over, but I believe there was some good that could be gleaned from that, even in my delinquency. Mm -hmm. So we're going to close with a prayer real quick here. If anybody feels led, please feel free. Deacon Davis? Yes. I just want to remind people that next Wednesday is Juneteenth and the church will be closed. And you said we will not have Bible study next Wednesday. Okay. That is correct. Next Wednesday, noonday, we will not have Bible study. And when we reconvene on the 26th, I believe the um, the candidate for senior pastor is going to be perhaps in attendance. I think that's been a suggestion. He won't necessarily be leading the class, but he will be an, an attendee at that, sir, at that noonday Bible study. So we will reconvene on the 26th. That's two weeks from today. Hope to see you all tonight at Bible at Vacation Bible School. If not, I'll see you Sunday in church. God bless you all. Let's close with a prayer. Mm -hmm. Father God, we thank you for yet another opportunity to study your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we that what we've discussed here today, what we thought, what we said was pleasing in thy sight. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to hold us in the hollow of your hand and wrap your loving arms of protection all around us until we can once again get together to worship you and to study all about you. We pray this in your son Jesus' name, and we say amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 In hours, though. <laughs> <laughs>